Hey, I'm Peter Coffin, and Jennifer Love Hewitt is aging. I am also aging. I am uh, consistently getting older all the time. It's weird. And um, obviously, I'm not lady presenting, so I'm not going to pretend that there's nothing at all to what Jennifer Love Hewitt is saying. But there is some element of being out of touch with the real world to complain about what Jennifer Love Hewitt has complained about. And then another place was like, she's unrecognizable. And so she's gone to filters because she doesn't want us to know how how bad she actually looks now in her oh, 40s. God. Oh, God. Oh, man. Why could they do that to you, pretty lady? Why I would never say anything like that to you, pretty lady. And I was like, this is crazy, right? So then I did a bunch of like over the top, like crazy filters on my Instagram. And I was like, all natural, no filter, like trying to make fun of it. And then they came after me for that. And they were like, well, now she's just defending herself. And like, why is she defending? You know how when you respond to things online with, I'm not bothered. You know how it's because you're bothered? And I realized, I was like, I can do, I can do no, I can do and no And why right. are and you this, focusing so much on these assholes who have nothing better to do than to put you down? Because, because to pretend that we don't is I a know, lie. I know, I know. You're we're, right. we're human. And yes, they're known as haters and they're known as people who like, you're just supposed to turn your comments off and you're supposed to, but it's human nature to be like, what do people think about me? I've been an actor for 36 years. You know this, like you're the same way. It's like- Now I wanna call some pretty specific attention to what she just said right there, cause it's gonna be extremely relevant in just a few seconds. In her view, it is human nature to want to know what the people who see you think of you. Keep that one here, keep it here. You don't wanna care what people think about you, but you have to care what people think about you. You wanna know, what's out there. And I will say the majority of people have been very kind to me. They've grown up with me. They look like I do now, right? We're all getting lines and maybe in menopause and who knows what else is coming for us, <laughs> you know, about to get a colonoscopy, like, whatever. like we're all there I got one and too. it's beautiful and it's weird. And, you know, we're all doing it together and it's fine. But like, there are those people out there. And the only reason those people bother me is because I think that it is, I, I'm a, I'm a mother of a girl. And it's dangerous what we put on people. It's dangerous, I think, to say to women, you can't, you can't look like you're not 22 to me anymore because I don't know how to, I don't know how to take that. Okay, well, that's your problem because I'm 44 and I, this is what I look like, you know what I mean? Um, and so it just, it just bothered me in that way that I feel like, I just feel like we're, and, and by the way, that whatever age it is, I feel like people, maybe these people like have picked, they seem to have picked like somewhere between 23 and 25 for me, which by the way, she was a looker, like congratulations to that 23 or 25. <laughs> but I'm a different person now. Yeah, you, you know, um, and it's great, but there's also like that 23 and 25 year old wasn't in her body. like. At 23, it's 24, 25, I didn't feel self-confident. I felt watched. I felt like I had to be everything for everybody all the time. I was called sexy before I ever knew what se being sexy was. Like I was 17 years old on the, on the cover of Maxim. And I had no idea why I was on the cover of Maxim. I was, I was honored and I loved it, but I was like, what? You know? So... I've seen a lot of people talk about this. There's been a lot of people that have responded to her saying, I felt watched. I didn't feel self-confident. I felt watched. And I think that it didn't come off well. And I want to be fair to her. I'm not like, I'm not saying like she's full of crap or anything, but she is complaining about being sexualized. And this is a thing that happens in different rungs of life. I think that's actually kind of the problem though. In a, let's say, retail situation, if there is an attractive woman who is being sexually harassed, that's kind of an automatic big old problem. Whether she's sexually harassed by a boss, a customer, or whatever, that's messed up. 
it, it, it's a situation that shouldn't happen. And there also is a weirdness about being at work in, say, a public-facing job like that, where you don't really have any control over your situation, and people are watching, so to speak. Like, I, I, I want to put forward that that's a real issue, but that's not the same thing that Jennifer Love Hewitt is talking about. People sort of automatically can tell there's an element of BS in a statement like this, even though I want to say that contextually speaking, people are not being as kind as they could be, but there's also a reason why they're mad about something like this. Jennifer Love Hewitt is, is not a retail worker um, working in a job in which she has no choice whatsoever uh, whether or not people gawk at her. There is no celebrity hot or not, whose job isn't to be gawked at. And it, it makes sense that people don't like the idea of being objectified, but here's the thing. If you are an actor, an influencer, or, or, or some kind of media personality, somebody who exists as an image on a screen to someone else, you are being objectified as a job. That image of you on the screen, that is an object. It is an image commodity. It is a reduction of yourself into an aesthetic. And that aesthetic, uh, it exists in various commodity relationships, whether they be a direct, you know, MCM type transaction where somebody like buys a poster of you because of whatever, if you're a cool rock star, you're a sexy lady, whatever. Or if you're a personality who exists on a TV show and it's supported by advertising, people are expending their time and that is getting you paid. It's a less straightforward transaction, but they're still buying you, so to speak. A media personality of any type complaining about being objectified in any way rings false to a normal person. If some attractive woman is stocking shelves at Walmart and she's being leered at, that's not part of the job. That's just some person being creepy in a public place. If an actress is attractive in a film or a television show or a magazine shoot or whatever, it, it, it's a little out of touch to say in a negative connotation, I felt like I was being watched. Like there's a reason that people take offense to something like that. It's because that's what you're being paid to do. Again, whether you're hot or not, it doesn't matter how attractive you are. Now, you might say, well, I don't like being sexualized. But the fact is, what you really don't like is being objectified, being reduced to a singular aesthetic that doesn't necessarily include all the aspects of your personality that you might be proud of. This is what being a media personality is, though. The feminist concern of being sexualized is valid when we're talking about somebody like the attractive woman stocking stuff at Walmart, the attractive cashier at Walmart, the attractive office worker, whatever. Pick something. And it doesn't even have to be women exclusively either. It can be somebody of any gender. I don't care. Those are interpersonal concerns and concerns about behavior in various situations. But the thing is, as a media personality, as a celebrity, as a known quantity that appears in the media, on a screen, on a, a poster, on a magazine, whatever, you are an image commodity. And I'm not saying that is a good thing. I don't think that the person as image commodity mode of uh, relationships, you know, the one that's really conducive to parasocial relationships that develops all these really unhealthy attachments to people that we don't know. I don't think that's good, but I don't think the problem is you're being watched. And that's what like these right wing people take advantage of. They see like a celebrity, somebody out of touch, say something that might have some vague reality to it but they don't know anything about the material relationships at play and they aren't are articulating any kind of real critique. In fact, they kind of sound like an entitled asshole because no other person has to deal with that kind of thing and no other person gets paid that amount of money. They take that and they go, see, feminism, it's evil. 
And I don't think that feminism is evil. I think a lot of the concerns it articulates are, are very real. I, I just think that it's silly. Because in feminism, the way that you fix problem A, which is person in normal job getting leered at or sexually harassed or like quid pro quo sexual harassment where the boss offers a raise or a promotion of some kind or special treatment contingent on X, Y, Z. We don't need to get into exactly what that means, but you can probably fill in the blanks. It equates that stuff with what Jennifer Love Hewitt is talking about. Feminism ignores all class lines in favor of identity lines. Here, the enemy is ultimately men. Obviously, there's a, there's a nice male ally talking to her and supporting her throughout this conversation. Although uh, Michael Rosenbaum maybe picked a podcast title that doesn't have the best connotation when talking about sexualization. Um, the podcast is, it, it's called Inside of You. Yeah, one of those podcasts to talk about the sexualization of women. What's the podcast called? Uh, it's called Inside of You. But feminism is an idealist critique. It is not about any material relationship of power. It is about people's interpersonal behavior and what they choose to do with women. The feminist response to the attractive Walmart stalker is that people should behave better. And yeah, but it's not articulating a critique that leads to any change in the relationship of power. It's really ultimately about putting the woman into a position where people around her have to choose the right behavior. She has no power not to be in that situation because it's a job. That's how people live. They earn money and they pay rent. And that's also kind of why Jennifer Love Hewitt complaining about feeling watched uh, when her job was to be on TV and in movies. It doesn't come off great because it's not her only choice. She could have, you know, become a Walmart stalker. She could have worked in an office. She could have, you know, gotten a degree. And her only choice wasn't to become an incredibly rich, well-known actress. That's why people find this kind of stuff distasteful. And, and it's also kind of why I, I think that it's important to go past feminism. And that's not to say, like, well, the concerns that every feminist brings up, we must just dismiss. Um, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that we have to criticize things on a material basis of power. And it may very well be that Jennifer Love Hewitt is not the owning class. She may not be the person in final control in this situation. However, she's also not a person with no options. She's not a person who's working a job that she feels cornered by. She's not a person who is stuck. She's a famous actress talking about filters and Instagram. And I feel like it's a reflection of the problems of both the left and right. With the right wing, yes, this is a person kind of just complaining about being a celebrity and doing it through the lens of what is typically known as feminist discourse. So they're, to some extent, exaggerating and using this for their own purposes, but there's a reason they're able to, and it's that the left, obsessed with these idealistic critiques like feminism, is all too happy to ignore the idea that the bad guy is the material relationship of power. It's not some guy, it's not some group of guys, it's not even the owning classes gender or sex or what have you. It's that people are put into positions that they have to be in, which expose them to things that they have no control over. And the thing about that is to own is to have control. That is the Marxist critique. There is a, a class that owns and they rule because they own, they have the control over everything. And then there's everybody else. Yes, ideology shifts around allegiances and um, internal motives, but that's 
the material relationship that you should be criticizing if you want to change any of that stuff. That's the problem of the left. They have this idealistic criticism that draws lines along identity and separates people that don't need to be separated because truth be told, the people who really have to deal with those types of problems because all of the issues of power imbalance come from that relationship. Owning, not owning, haves, have nots. And I just wanted to use this as an example of how these ideological critiques, these idealist critiques um, really just don't get us anywhere. And following the left line or the right line tends to lead us to places where uh, the only point is really just to continue an argument. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. I think that's all for today. Um, I'll talk to you next time. Have a good evening.